Okay, very good morning. It's Thursday the 11th of November. Hope you're doing well and the market continues to digest yesterday's red hot inflation figure. Obviously, US CPI came in at 6.2% year on year, much higher than expected 5.8 and in fact even 0.2 higher than even the most bullish estimate on the street. And so that's really the main feature um, of what markets are really tackling at the moment and that's been um, echoed as well. The producer price inflation in Japan figures overnight came in at a figure um, basically reflecting its highest level in more than 40 years. So in the last week we've actually seen the inflationary uh, pressure mounting globally from the likes of the Chinese economy, the US and Japan, the world's three largest economies. And so yeah, for sure, uh, this is the main factor at play at the moment. And given the fact the calendar is pretty quiet today, it's probably going to be still the main kind of sentiment driver for proceedings going forward. Um, what I'm going to start with here is the dollar uh, and then talk about a few different things. And so first off, um, to give you some perspective, this is looking at the dollar index. Uh, obviously, yesterday, the reaction function was that US stocks fell the most in a month. The likes of the S&P was down about eight tenths, the S&P seven tenths, the NASDAQ, the biggest casualty was down about 1.66%. Those tech um, growth sensitive names obviously reacting quite negatively to the increasing yield environment giving the red hot inflation figures. Um, subsequently, the dollar hit a 52 week high, as you can see here, a bit of a breakout above those October highs, putting us at um, the highest levels we've basically traded at since going back. Uh, 52 weeks uh, and that impacting oil as well which was down three percent yesterday um, but looking at this from a technical perspective the dollar index is basically closing in on 95 and around this kind of 94 90 95 area is really quite key for the dixie as you can see here going all the way back to the peak that we had in november of 2017 to the lows that we had in early 2019 the initial kind of bottom of the route at the early part of the onset of the pandemic and volatility we saw there and the price recoveries we've seen in September of 2020 and also just about a month ago as well. And so it's going to be interesting to see how the dollar behaves here and certainly these major currency pairs uh, at the moment, euro dollar cable reflecting this dollar led movement at this present point uh, in time that would mirror this kind of Dixie price movement. Um, going to start though and have a look at um, just some stocks news first and then we'll talk about some global uh, macro kind of news themes from UK COVID to potential delays to build back better spending plan in the US um, and also China Evergrande managed to avert a default once again for the third time this month with making a last minute payment overnight and we'll have a look at those stories. Uh, but going to kick things off with the aftermarket. Um, not talking about every single stock story that came out, but just wanted to talk about some of the more uh, kind of trending names. And Disney certainly is one of them, particularly in the streaming space, with the likes of Netflix gaining a lot of attention, of course, with Squid Game success. Um, but Disney came out and actually fell quite sharply in aftermarket trading. You can see here the shares were down about 4.5%. Uh, after their numbers hit the tape. And the reason why is that their revenues were amiss. The adjusted EPS came in at 37 cents, below the expected 49. Um, their Disney Plus subscribers was also in line with the company's broad expectations, slightly soft against the street, 118.1 million. Uh, analysts were expecting 119.6 million. Uh, the CEO said the segment's growth had hit some headwinds and that Disney expected to add low single-digit millions of streaming subscribers in Q4. Uh, their average monthly revenue per subscriber for Disney Plus also is down about 9% year over year. And part of the reason for that is as they try to expand geographically into different areas, they've had a reduction in lower price points for Disney Plus and Hotstar, which is a bundle that they tend typically sell on the likes of Indonesia and India, uh, which generates uh, a smaller margin for the business. So yeah, Disney uh, missed on their Disney Plus subscriber estimates and, and numbers all round um, pretty weak and consequently their shares were lower. The other kind of major stock story from yesterday, which of course um, I'm sure you saw, was the electric vehicle startup uh, Rivian. They set a record um, <laughs> basically at their first day of trade without any type of meaningful revenue that exists at this point. But as per the kind of Tesla 
um, case study. I mean, since when did that matter, right? So they surged on their NASDAQ debut. They had an opening market value of more than $100 billion. So they're particularly large to just get things up and running. And to put that into some context, that would make them bigger than Ford and General Motors, um, who obviously are the mature players in the space. Um, to give you some idea as well, who is backing this firm, Amazon's stake at the IPO price is worth about $12.5 billion. And even rival automaker Ford uh, has a stake in this company, uh, and they hold around 12.1% of the firm post-IPO, which is worth about $8 billion US dollars as well on the IPO listing price. Um, the other thing was Elon Musk. Obviously, it's been a recurring theme. I'm sure you've been reading about it since his Twitter poll on Saturday. Um, but it's come clear now that he has so far disposed of around 45 million shares this week and that total equates to around 5 billion US dollars according to regulatory filings which were released yesterday. Um, those were the first sales he's made in five years uh, and obviously come as um, he kind of front run the market with that poll um, that was issued as I said at the weekend. So their shares after having a, a really meteoric rise in recent weeks have had a bit of a tough time um, of late coming off those most elevated levels, but have found a bit of a floor at the $1,000 level. Um, they were peaking Tesla shares up at around uh, 1240. They're now trading on the close last night at 1068. Uh, but as I said, uh, finding a bit of a floor technically around the 1000 marker psychologically. Um, before I move on to the macro kind of coverage, uh, a few things I wanted to cover there. Just wanted to um, remind you that the Market Maker podcast um, continues uh, to, to put out episodes. We did one yesterday that went live, which was, uh, if you're a student, we've been doing a career hack series. We've covered higher view interviews, group exercises, virtual assessment centers, and yesterday we put one out specifically about why networking is so crucial if you're applying for any job in finance and some tips and tricks and things from um, our uh, industry experts and insights that we've have and we put this all together in the podcast episode yesterday so all you need to do is jump on spotify type amplify me market maker you'll see you'll see uh, my face and then um, you'll be able to get those episodes and, and not forgetting as well at the end of every week on a friday myself and head of trading peers will have that end of week informal discussion about the major themes so a really nice way as well to uh, if you find it difficult to stay on top of all of the macro news through the week this is your one kind of episode listen that makes sure that every week to week you're absolutely on your a game of what's going on in markets um, all right so on the macro front what have we got um, first off in the asia pack session china evergrande averted a, de a destabilizing potential default once again for the third time in just a month sources uh, have said several bondholders received coupon overdue coupon payments worth just under 150 million US dollars. So my overall take with Evergrande at the moment is that it's kind of yesterday's news. Um, I think particularly in the order of hierarchy at the moment, inflation has kind of taken the mantle now. And so Evergrande is one of those things that obviously you remain vigilant to monitor, but every single time that something comes due, they miss it, it goes into the 30 day grace period, they pay it at the last moment. And that seems to be just the way that this is going at the moment. And you know we've talked about this over many weeks and months now about the potential uh, systemic risk that any type of failure of Evergrande could have for the Chinese financial system and also reverberate potentially more globally. And so uh, the, the fact of the matter is at the moment it's being kept on life support for the time being and I'd expect that to be the case going forward. So it's interesting and it's noteworthy and it requires monitoring, but it's much lesser an impact as, as far as the story uh, ongoing at this moment in time from a, from a global level. The other thing we had in the asia Pac region was the Australian unemployment rate uh, did come in slightly higher, 5.2% above the expected 4.8% and the acceleration from 4.6% seen just the months before. But Australia has been trying to tackle with quite onerous lockdowns that have been coming on and off over the recent weeks and months. And so even though it's quite high at the moment, the expectations are once those start to be relaxed again, there's some pent up uh, demand will start to uh, populate um, the, the jobs market again uh, in time. 
The other thing then is talking about UK COVID. And I did have a bit of a tweet about this when, I, when it came out last night about it's funny how um, it seems to have gone quite silent talking about COVID um, either from the politicians in the UK or the mainstream media. And the reason for that is, is that COVID cases in the UK um, are declining. Um, and it's good news. England has recorded its longest unbroken run, in fact, of declining coronavirus daily caseloads since February, as COVID-19 related hospital emissions begin to fall in every region of the country, according to the latest analysis of the FT. And you can see here, the rates of cases, hospitalizations and deaths are now falling in, uh, in England. Um, all metrics here displayed or as a percentage of the peak value last winter as to where we're at at the moment, the red against the blue uh, at this point in time. Uh, the other thing as well that's quite interesting is separate data from the Office of National Statistics published yesterday showed uh, a rebound in antibody levels in the over 80s to 92% after falling by 6 percentage points to 88% between June and October. And so what you can see here is waning immunity as we go through the summer into really what was the early part of October. So this time last month, that was when the conversation very much was about the rolling out of boosters because of the fading efficacy rates of some of those early jabs that were issued to those who were most vulnerable and also the elder demographic. And so as those were waning, the boosters have come in uh, and this would mark then that there's been a, a relatively successful response to the campaign at the moment um, and thus then immunity boosts are kicking in at what some might argue is just the right period of time because obviously the weather's starting to change and there's going to be more people um, constrained to their homes and, and perhaps intermixing with people in a more closed confined space um, and typically what we have seen is that case rates do have a um, a, a pattern of rising over those periods, particularly with people congregating over Christmas and New Year's and things. But this should come in as these immunity um, levels have rebounded and obviously a timeliness of having the shot issued at, at this point in time. So it's one of the things here, I think, with COVID, there's a lot to digest at the moment if you're trading sterling, particularly more, um, I'd say, inflation policy dominated. So whether that's the dollar, dictating proceedings at the moment or whether that's the UK misfiring on their comms on the rate rise timing you've got Brexit simmering in the background still as well Covid's in there uh, still to be monitored I wouldn't say right right now today it's a it's a focal point but certainly it's, this is a little bit more um, of a positive development that we're seeing at this present point in time but as is ever with Covid we're definitely not out of the woods yet and so important that everyone uh, remains vigilant on that on that front and then yeah u.s politics um don't actually have something queued up to show you on the screen for politics but just an update where president biden <clears throat> is reportedly going to sign the infrastructure bill on monday uh, that's really not important information just a time uh, a timeline to to bear in mind in relevant news though and what is more important separately is it's been reported that Senator Joe Manchin, the person who's been the kind of thorn in Biden's side, um, could punt President Biden's Build Back Better agenda to next year amid inflation concerns. And the Build Back Better is that kind of subsequent policy package that Biden wants to push through of 1.75 trillion, which has been hotly contested both by the Dems and the Republicans about its size. It's basically got incrementally smaller as time has gone on having been initially in excess of three trillion and the idea i guess for mansion having just look at the surface level comments that he made is that he doesn't want to just implement more stimulus at a point where inflation is super hot at the moment and the likelihood is that more stimulus is only going to fuel that further so he wants to wait but the downside for biden is again he looks like a uh, a, a president who can't really in action anything at this point in time so stuck in a bit of a rock and a hard place is biden at the moment more stimulus potential then to price in even more inflation going forward which is negative but then if he doesn't act it shows um, the lack of authority that he holds then to push through any proposals that he's putting forward 
which again is a negative. So which one do you pick? And just goes to show the increasing burdens uh, and struggles of, of, of the president at this, minute, this point in time. Um, and then that is pretty much it, because from a calendar perspective today, as I said, it's going to be really, I think today is digestion of this overall global inflation picture at the moment, uh, because this isn't just unique to the case of what we saw yesterday in the US. It's very much so um, echoed uh, on a global level. Um, one thing actually that I did see that I thought was particularly good yesterday, and you're going to have to forgive me for how messy this is bringing up very briefly my emails, but I do put out a regular um, daily email. It's called The Market Maker. If you just go to amplifyme.com, there's a section on the bottom of the website where you can just input your email to join that, that mailing list. But there were some really good comments, I thought, from a Fed watcher called Tim, um, Tim Dewey. It's, I'm not sure how you say his surname, but Tim Dewey. And, and he said a couple of good points. And to surmise this briefing, and I think um, the general takeaway from yesterday's inflation figures, he said that there is plenty of room for pulling rates forward from 2023 into 2022, adding that, in other words, there is room to turn more hawkish without accelerating the pace of tapering. That's what he said in reference to the Fed. He argued that the Fed will become increasingly nervous about inflation, but it will not become so nervous that a policy pivot is imminent. And that's something that I think is very important to understand here of what we've had. He suggests that at a minimum, the Fed believes it has until March meeting before it needs to do some hard signaling about the second half of 2022. And moreover, you've also got, of course, the leadership turnover at the Fed argues for maintaining the status quo until the staffing um, settles out a little more as well because markets the one thing that they don't like is a lack of continuity on leadership uh, because that then creates uncertainty about policy direction so for these reasons uh, again it's definitely meaningful markets have definitely reacted are the fed gonna just flip on what they said the last week in their meeting about what they're going to do with policy i think not at this time they're just going to have to sweat it out a little bit because the inflation gorilla is lurking, as you can see uh, here. All right, that is it. Going to leave it there. Um, hopefully that was interesting and get you up to speed. And I will catch you same time tomorrow. Take care.